All right, what's happening, y'all? It's your boy Rico from Street Scores, and I have some major Washington Commanders free agency updates, man. Of course, the legal tampering period starts March 11th, and then the new league year officially starts March 13th. So that's when the free agency technically starts, but we're already getting a lot of updates. I'm going to give y'all some major updates around the NFL about who's getting cut, who's available, and things like that soon, maybe later tonight, maybe tomorrow, something like that. I'm going to keep y'all updated on that all the way leading up to free agency. But today we're talking about how the Washington Commanders seem to be letting Cameron Curl leave. It's already confirmed from Adam Peters himself that they don't plan on franchise tagging any players. That includes Cameron Curl. And then Cameron Curl had a cryptic tweet that basically signaled that he's leaving the commanders or at the very least at minimum testing the waters to see what's going on free agency to see who may potentially want to sign them. And basically the commanders are not getting the first dibs on them. Then also Head coach Dan Quinn and defensive coordinator Joe Witt Jr. apparently have big plans for linebacker Jamin Davis to attack the quarterback. We're going to do a full breakdown into that and why that makes perfect sense. I literally just talked about something like that a couple of days ago, and now it makes even more sense. Shouts out to Ben Standig from The Athletic for the full breakdown of all of that. We're going to talk about that. And also... I'm seeing a report that the commanders may potentially be interested in running back DeAndre Swift from the Eagles, ex-Lions running back, and of course, for me, Georgia Bulldog. We're going to dive into all that and more, but before we do, make sure you stiff arm that like button, stiff arm the subscription button, and stiff arm the bell next to that subscription button so you get notification each and every time I release an informative and opinionated video just like this one. Again, I'm keeping you updated on everything, not only just commanders, but NFL-wise as well, especially if it potentially affects the commanders, like... For example, Eric Kendrick's getting cut by the Chargers. Maybe that's a target for the commander. So I'm going to do video updates on things like that as well that involve the NFL, but also more specifically from the commander's point of view. And I'm also working on a big time trade back mock draft. So stay tuned for that. Maybe later tonight or tomorrow. Be on the lookout for my draft prospect film sessions. All of the best players that I want in free agency at each position group that we have a major need at all of those types of videos so stay tuned without further ado man let's go and get to this video right now let's get it Now, first of all, the commanders did not franchise tag anybody. The deadline was today, Tuesday, March 5th at 4 p.m. I'm recording this as of right now at 6.30. The deadline is passed, and we did not franchise tag anybody. And really, not a, I mean, not many players just got franchise tagged in general. The Baltimore Ravens franchise tag defensive tackle Justin Matabike. Carolina Panthers franchise tag, sadly, edge rusher Brian Burns, but that was kind of expected. Chicago Bears franchise tag cornerback Jalen Johnson that I mean that's a big one to keep right there he, he came onto the scene and, and boy that's a different type of guy right there Cincinnati Bengals franchise tag wide receiver T Higgins I believe he was the first one out of everybody where it was like obvious that that team was gonna franchise tag that player so T Higgins was like the first player that was technically franchise tag and then you also have the Colts franchise tag and wide receiver Michael Pittman the Jaguars franchise tag in edge rusher josh allen sadly for washington commanders fans but again that's another one that we pretty much saw coming the kansas city chiefs franchise tagged cornerback lajarius sneed and that made a lot of sense as well because you already lost travarius ward to the 49ers a couple of years ago you don't want to let the same thing potentially happen with lajarius sneed and then the Tampa bay buccaneers franchise tagged antoine winfield they got a long-term deal done with mike evans and so then antoine winfield was the one that ended up getting the tag and then it's basically not looking good for the commanders as far as odds of us re-signing camera curl long term man it's not looking good at all and all of this started from earlier today at 4 5 p.m immediately after the franchise tag deadline ended which again ended at 4 p.m within five minutes later cameron curl tweeted up the deuces on twitter man and so you already know what that means and basically at this point if it's not us then it looked like it is going to be somebody because he just tweeted a couple of weeks ago saying just went crazy at dick sporting goods for all of the times that i couldn't and first of all, just to go back to the deuces, to just insinuate the fact that you're leaving means that I'm not staying, like, to, I'm gone. Like, even though the commanders didn't franchise tag me, 
if they were potentially at some point in contracts talks where it's like okay maybe things are going well maybe he doesn't tweet the deuces maybe he's like yeah they didn't franchise tag me because we have this deal we're working on behind the scenes but he put up the deuces after the franchise tag like well now i know as of 4 p.m i'm not getting franchise tagged and i'm assuming based on where contract talks are he's like well that must mean i'm gone because we haven't had much communication at all if he's gonna tweet something like that and then also with the Dick Sporting Goods shopping spree point, he's coming off of a seventh round rookie deal. And even though any NFL money is still pretty good money, why is he suddenly going on a shopping spree now? Does he know something that we don't? Maybe there's a team out there that values him more than Adam Peters and Dan Quinn, Joe Jr. and all of those guys. And they're also willing to pay him more money. And maybe he already has an idea who they who that may be. Maybe he has a market out there. And he's like, man, I can go ahead and go on my shopping spree now because I know I'm about to get paid later as soon as free agency starts or something like that. Those are just all speculations that I'm throwing out there from cryptic Cameron Curl tweets. Those are just my thoughts on those. But of course, none of those are like official reports of things that have actually happened. So now... I'm definitely assuming that the percentage chance that Cameron Crow comes back to Washington is basically depleted. Like, it's very minimal. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's very minimal. And of course, me being Rico of Street Scores, we got to talk about why the commanders should go ahead and give him the money that he wants. And also why they actually shouldn't. Why they may potentially just go ahead and let him walk. Because we may potentially already have his replacement on roster right now. But of course, we also got to talk about the money parts of it as well. But that's soon. And it's crazy because just right before the combine, Nikki Javala said that she thought a deal would potentially get done. She tweeted, I still think they keep Cameron Curl. He's a quality player and you keep those guys. So her logic was more so based on his impact on the field more so than like her hearing anything from adam peters or the commander's decision makers that he will end up staying so it was more so i think he should stay than i think he will stay from her side but when i saw that tweet again that was before the combine i was like okay so maybe we should be optimistic about the fact that they will keep Cameron Curl, they'll sign him long term because she's very close to the commander's organization and everything but it's not looking too good right now so what, another way to look at this is that with Antoine Winfield getting franchise tagged and Kyle Duggar getting transition tagged, you can argue that Cameron Curl and the New York Giants' Xavier McKinney are probably the two best safeties on the market, and they're probably going to command somewhere around like $14 million per year potentially. And that actually adds up with Spot Track's projected market value, where they say he's worth an average annual salary of. 14.4 million dollars per year in his next contract they predict him to get a four-year 57.739 million dollar contract again which is worth 14.4 million dollars per year which would make him the fifth highest paid safety and the 138th highest paid nfl player period and they use derwin james minka fitzpatrick jesse bates and marcus williams as references for that average annual value contract and between all of those guys he would be the one that's paid the least other than marcus williams marcus williams got 14 $15 million dollars per year in his contract when he was 25 years old camera curl is going to be 25 years old by the time this league year starts by the time like the well the nfl regular season starts and they're estimating him to get paid slightly more than what marcus williams got but considerably less than the 16 million per year jesse bates got at 26 years old considerably less than the 18.4 million dollars per year that Mika Fitzpatrick got at 25 and Derwin James got a 19 million dollar per year contract at 26 years old so I guess the safety market is a little bit more volatile I mean you have some guys making 19 million dollars per year and then percentage wise Marcus Williams out here making 14 million dollars per year that's a pretty big gap going from him to Derwin James and so Cameron Curl is somewhere in the middle of that closer to Marcus Williams than Derwin James spot track predicts so I think, honestly, the question is at that point, is he worth that price? Honestly, like, is he worth $14 million a year? Well, first of all, the safety market is probably only less appreciated around NFL circles than like the running back and tight end positions, excluding special teams, of course. Because as of right now, as far as devalued positions go, safeties boy it's it's bad elite safeties are out here making the same type of money that average players make at other position groups for some reason they're just completely just 
it seems like they're colluding against the safety position. I mean, if you think about it, the Eagles just released Kevin Byard. Justin Simmons is reportedly on the trade block and may actually end up going to the Eagles like I reported earlier today with that full NFL rumors and reports breakdown that I did. CJ Garner Johnson is potentially looking for a new home as well. The Seattle Seahawks released both safeties, Quandre Diggs and Jamal Adams. And poor Jamal Adams, he's not wanted by his current well, slash X team in the Seattle Seahawks, nor his former team, the Jets. So right now, he's just floating around. Antoine Winfield was the best safety in all of football last year, and he got franchise tag for $17 million rather than getting a long-term deal. And even just how cheap the franchise tag is for safeties, just for reference, let's just talk about how devalued the safety position is just compared to other position groups just by how much franchise tags are worth. Quarterback franchise tags for the 2024 season are worth $38 million. Linebackers are $24 million. Defensive tackles are $22. Wide receivers are $22 as well, but slightly under defensive tackle. Defensive end is $21. Offensive lineman is right under 21. Cornerback is 19.8. And then you get the safeties and their franchise tag value is 17.123 million. Only things below that are tight end, running back, and special teams. That's it. Very, very undervalued position in football. Because then you even have Kyle Duggar, who just got transition tagged by the Patriots, not even franchise tag. So basically the Patriots decided that they would pay Duggar less money with the transition tag, then the franchise tag, and just dare another NFL team to actually value safeties and not only try to pay him that money to match the Patriots, but then to also be willing to give up draft picks as in compensation as well. Again, the transition tag allows you to pay a player less than a franchise tag would. So Kyle Duggar's making somewhere over $3 million less than what Antoine Winfield is getting on his franchise tag right now for the 2024 season. So again, with all of that being said, it seems like the commanders are basically following the league-wide trend of devaluing the safety position, especially the box safety position. We'll talk about that later. And Cameron Curl is basically like, nah, man, F all of that. Give me my money, yuns, man. And the NFL is probably doing some evil stuff where they're all colluding together to basically devalue certain positions. Basically looking around at each other like, hey, man, if you won't pay them, I won't either type of time. You know what I'm saying? Like if if all 32 teams decide to not pay safeties, tight ends and running backs a lot of money then we can get away with it. Then they'll be forced to take whatever cheap little money that all 32 teams end up offering them as like a set market value from our collusion. It, it, you know, it's evil stuff. Business is business. We'll see how it goes. And as long as one team, one NFL team doesn't falter, doesn't deviate from the plan, then they can get away with it. And then also, even if you're looking at the average salary for each position group that's being paid, from the 2023 NFL season. We'll see if maybe it changes with the 2024 season, but long snapper was the lowest, fullback was second, then punter, then running back, then actually corner, then wide receiver, then tight end, then safety. And then kickers on average are paid more than safeties are in the NFL, which is crazy. Then you have defensive tackles, then center, then defensive end, then guard, then edge rusher, outside linebacker, inside linebacker, right tackle, quarterback, and then left tackles actually make the most money on average out of any other position group in the NFL, but there's special circumstances for that because there are a lot of really cheap veteran minimum quarterbacks out there swaying the value and basically being the outliers that bring their, their average down to below left tackles. And then this also may be a situation where Cameron Curl and Kendall Fuller are fighting against each other for the same one contract. Just like how we were talking about how Chase Young and Montez Sweat were fighting for potentially the same one contract that the commanders were willing to offer both of them. It was they, just one contract between the two of y'all, and then that's it. And then it may be a similar situation here, or it may just be just like how the whole Chase Young and Montez Sweat situation went, where they let both guys walk, and Cameron Curl and Kendall Fuller, neither of those guys end up with a contract. I wouldn't be surprised if it's one contract for all of our top unrestricted free agents like Curtis Samuel, Cameron Curl, Antonio Gibson, and Kendall Fuller all fighting for one contract, even though both of those, all of those players play on different sides of the ball. It may just be one contract available for all four of those guys and take it or leave it type of situation. Otherwise, you're going to be getting paid very cheap money below what you're actually probably even worth. And also, is Cameron Curl even really a fit for this defense regardless of how much money is involved? Like, 
you can argue even if he were to take like a really cheap deal, even just ignoring money, just take money out of the equation. Is Karen McCurl actually a good fit for what the new commanders coaching staff want to actually do on defense? Because first of all, Joe Witt Jr. said that he wants people that are explosive, are quick, and that can catch really well. And Cameron Curl is arguably neither of those traits. He's not fast, and you can definitely say that he's not a great catcher of the football. Even though you can't teach his length, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, Quan Martin, on the other hand, is literally the embodiment of all of those traits that Joe Witt Jr. says that he wants in his DBs, especially the safeties. Also, shouts out to Bleed and Burgundy and Gold for pointing this out. While Curl can play in the box, neither fit the measurables of strong safeties in Quinn's systems before. Cam Chancellor, six foot three, two hundred thirty pounds. Neil, six foot two hundred twenty pounds. Most recently with the Cowboys, Curse, six foot four, two hundred twenty pounds. He seems to prefer his box safeties being guys that are more like linebackers than safeties, if anything, which is really interesting. That's more like a Kalik Hudson than it would be like a Cameron Curl. I'm not saying Kalik Hudson's better than Cameron Curl, but he's probably a better fit just based on history and what dan quinn wants for his defenses and i'm pretty sure adam peters is taking that into account this is adam peters team he makes the decisions as far as who we sign who we don't sign who we resign who we don't resign who we trade for who we get in the draft all of that type of stuff but of course he's gonna take into account what dan quinn and joe Witt jr want to do on defense what cliff kingsbury wants to do on offense and things like that and apparently based on the fits the commanders don't value camera curl as much as he feels like he should be valued in a contract so there we go and also when you're talking about about how devalued safeties are again just to emphasize the box safety which camera curl i feel like is even though he has experience as strong safety the, the commanders moved him to strong safety last year more so than anything else so that they can avoid him getting hurt but really he's more naturally a box safety covering tight ends and things like that so with camera curl being a box safety you can argue that box safety is the type of safety that's literally bringing down the property values of the safety position like that one bad house in the neighborhood bringing down the value of everybody else's houses when you're looking at average safety contracts the box safeties are skewing that average down which brings me to the point that not only is camera curl a safety period which is already devalued but he's also more specifically a box safety so that's why the commanders definitely don't see it worth paying him whatever money he's asking for because he's like the lowest valued version of already one of the three undervalued positions in football if that makes sense but now on the positives as to why the commanders may potentially actually end up wanting to keep him on one end he was a very important part of the commander's defense last year and you can see like statistically any game that he wasn't in we were worse and any game that he was in we were slightly better especially the 2022 season that was when it was the most obvious 2023 season it kind of seemed like even when he was on the field we were just so bad it didn't matter but the 2022 season if you go look at that the games that Cameron Curl played in how much better we were than in the games when he didn't play and then also on top of that you can't teach his length his great ability to cover tight ends is very hard to find. I'm not going to lie. He's not very athletic. He's not quick. He's not fast. But his arm length is very useful. And his instincts are technically coachable. And maybe you can coach a guy to get those instincts with time. But most people never get it. And Kermit Curl definitely has the instincts that you covet from a safety. But then again, going back to why the commanders potentially shouldn't end up signing him to whatever money he's potentially asking for back to the other end he doesn't produce elite stats now if you're looking at the advanced stats yes but like the surface stats like interceptions he doesn't get those which is what NFL agents and NFL teams are quick to point to in contract negotiations. If there's a player that gets a lot of interceptions, the agent is like, look at the interceptions. Look at the interceptions. Don't pay attention to nothing else. Look at his interceptions. Pay him accordingly. But if it's a guy like Cameron Curl, then the NFL team in reverse this time is pointing at the interceptions like look at the interceptions he doesn't get them so we're only offering them this much amount of money because he doesn't get them interceptions is really the metric that safeties get paid off of sadly because they do a lot more than that but that's just how it goes for just dbs in general and also if anything a new regime coming in they probably do not value Cameron Curl as much as Ron Rivera and Jack DeRio just simply because you don't miss something that you've never had like they've never had Cameron Curl in their defense. So why would they come in here and immediately miss him when they've never played him? They've never coached him. They've never done anything with him. 
So it's technically not like they're losing anything. Us as Commanders fans, we feel like we're losing a player. But technically, Dan Quinn and Joe Witt Jr. did not lose Cameron Curl. They never technically had him. And then also, Logan Paulson and Craig Hoffman on their podcast that they do together like a couple of weeks ago, way before the combine, brought up some interesting points as to why the Commanders should not re-sign Cameron Curl. And... I mean, they bring up some pretty decent points. They said, first of all, Quan Martin already looks like he's probably going to be literally a better version of Cameron Curl, but with just basically more explosion and quickness and just pure athleticism and at a way cheaper price for the next few years while he's still on his rookie deal, his second round rookie deal, making only like $1.9 million per year compared to Cameron Curl potentially getting like $14.4 million per year according to Spot Track, or maybe even more than that that maybe that he's asking for even higher annual value and then of course you start to think about what you could do with that money for other position groups on our team where like you really have bigger needs and if you truly believe that Quan Martin is literally destined to be better than Cameron Curl to have a way cheaper but better Cameron Curl is insane value you let Cameron Curl walk you let Quan Martin dominate on a way cheaper price tag and then you use that money on other position groups and they brought up a lot of great points, so make sure you go check that out if you want all of their points. But that was one of like the main ones that I felt like fit this situation. And also me personally, of course, I feel like I would love to have both Cameron Curl and potentially better Cameron Curl at the same time. But just hopefully at a cheaper price than what it looks like Cameron Curl is asking for. But like a few months ago, I've really wanted to sign Cameron Curl and I was willing to give him big money for it. But now, as of today... I'm actually pretty okay with him walking and basically just trusting Adam Peters to find the guys and Dan Quinn and Joe Wood Jr. to coach the guys, especially with us having, again, bigger holes around the roster as well on top of everything else. But now that we're letting Cameron Curl walk, now safety is another big hole, potentially, you can argue. Again, unless Quan Martin is ready to step up to be the better Cameron Curl. Again, a lot of people believe Cameron Quan Martin can step up and play that immediate role and be even better at it. But there's still a hole in your defense when you lose Cameron Curl no matter what. There's a reason that him as in Cameron Curl and Quan Martin won the field at the same time a lot of the time last year. Granted, Derek Forrest was hurt, but still, losing Cameron Curl makes your team slightly worse at the very least regardless of what's going on regardless of fit not having a camera curl on your team means your team is slightly not as good but then the question then becomes is that potentially 14.4 million dollars a year in cap space better off being put towards a combination of multiple players to fill holes around at other position groups and i'm not gonna lie we probably should have known that this was destined to end up going this way based on Cameron curl's exit interview because they literally asked him what were his goals as a free agent he said quote i'm trying to get richer than i am right now unquote and that doesn't necessarily mean that he's asking for all of the money in the world but it does sound like hey man pay me my money -ons. i need big money -ons with this next contract and for reasons i've already stated the commanders look like they probably don't want to give that to him and then shouts out to john con for bringing up this point and tweeting this at 5 17 p.m today for those wondering if washington will make a splash signing because of cap space new owner desiring of energizing the fan base the guy who would have taken that approach sold the team in july this group will approach differently need to be active with holes to fill but not crazy money and i want to point out that active like john com said does not necessarily equal splash big time signing to elite market setting money you can be active in free agency without having to sign one particular guy to a lot of money that just means we're going to end up signing a lot of guys, but we're potentially going to sign a lot of cheaper, smart value options than like the big guy. Not to say we won't go sign maybe one or two big time signers that will have Commanders fans all over the internet super excited but we just basically john Kahn, and what i'm also telling you is to prepare for the fact that maybe we don't go out and get an elite edge rusher maybe we'll get some good ones maybe we'll get one or two good ones that are better than what we currently have but don't expect us to go out there and get like a bryce huff from the jets necessarily we'll see though also shouts out to disco for bringing up this point to adding to john Kahn's point he said to this point the commanders have a lot of holes to fill i suspect 10 to 15 starters that we need to figure out and i expect low to medium price free agents that will hopefully be coached up to be competitive and make this team at the very least watchable this season we may not be super bowl contenders immediately but maybe it's just better not to spend all of our 
cap space right now and then just build a team that's at least decent and competitive this year and then when we're ready and when we have a better idea after i mean joe witt jr even said it in his press conference give us some time to actually coach up these guys to see what holes we actually have because we're assuming that we have a hole at safety but you never know maybe under dan quinn joe witt jr and jason simmons who came over from the raiders who's very good at developing dbs maybe percy butler Derek forrest and Quan martin are all we need at the safety position and maybe somebody that we find in the draft as well and they get pro bowl level play out of those guys and now we would feel silly for even thinking about signing cameron curl for long-term money when those guys are getting paid cheap money and they're playing at a very high level same thing with corner I mean, maybe we don't need to draft corner like immediately, like as soon as the second round, because with Emmanuel Forbes and Benjamin St. Juice and maybe some other random guys on the roster, maybe some underrated free agency signers that we make in like within the next week or two, maybe if they get in the hands of a Joe Witt Jr., those guys ball out. Emmanuel Forbes looks like the first round pick that he was selected as. And now we don't feel like we have as much of a need at corner. So maybe it's more so let's take the time to see what these guys can do under coaching. And then after the, the a first full year of coaching, development, playing games, now we have a better idea going into the 2025 free agency, what we actually really need rather than just assuming what we need, paying big money for it this free agency. And then we find out later on, man, we can could have saved that money because this guy that we just drafted a year or two ago in like the third or fourth round was perfectly fine at handling that responsibility so i could see them being very smart about it and again to go back to john com's point us spending ridiculous money immediately in free agency before especially before this team has had the time to evaluate these guys sounds more like a dan snyder move than anything else but I do, again, just like John Com said, expect us to be very active in free agency. It just may not be a lot of top headlining free agency signings, but we're going to be signing a lot of people to fill a lot of these holes. I mean, first of all, we don't even have much of a roster at all. And then moving on to the next topic, Ben Standig of The Athletic said that Jamin Davis isn't necessarily changing positions, but the commanders are eyeing a plan that puts the athletic linebacker in a better position to get after the quarterback. And I'm super excited. First of all, I was just talking about this a few days ago that with his athletic profile, he should be moving forward more often and backwards a little less basically is how I worded it. Now he did. We saw him flash in that in coverage especially at times especially last year during that falcons game that i went to last year but even coming out of the draft there were debates about between him and michael parsons who was the biggest freak athlete at the linebacker position available in that draft and then both of those guys have very high ceilings i preferred micah at the time and i was even willing to trade up slightly to take them and then the rest is history but you saw how dan quinn and joe Wood jr were able to use michael parsons in dallas and he's an off-ball linebacker but also an edge rusher and now imagine what they could do with jamin davis in washington now i'm expecting jamin davis to be in coverage more than a michael parsons to be an off-ball linebacker more often than michael parsons but i do expect him to be somewhat of a blend like michael parsons but michael parsons is definitely going to be more of an edge rusher jamin davis is going to be more so like a will linebacker that covers people like running backs out of the backfield and things like that but i think both of those guys could have like a healthy blend of all of those different things so i'm really excited and so ben standig and the athletic went on like did a full dive into this and said the commander see using the 2021 first round linebacker more in pass rush situations this upcoming season the plan is to have the athletically gifted davis become a hybrid defender which should translate into less pass coverage and more attempts at getting after the quarterbacks exactly what i've been saying don't sleep on jamin davis this upcoming season under new coaching now a lot of it may have been his fault but i feel like it was more so coaching than anything else and i feel the same way about emmanuel forbes i feel the same way about the fact that Quan Martin wasn't able to show what he could do until so late in the season I feel like that with a lot of players on both offense and de on defense and maybe even special teams as well I can see even Larry Izzo coming in and getting the best out of Casimir Allen to be our starting punt returner and kick returner of the future and things like that I can see Cliff Kingsbury coming in and we potentially re-sign Antonio Gibson and now he finally looks like who we hoped that Scott Turner and Eric Bieniemy would turn him into a dominant fantasy option a mismatch nightmare for a lot of defenses where teams literally at the game plan form things like that i see that all over the place with the fact that we've just 
upgraded the coaching staff mightily compared to what we had previously. That's a logical consideration on many levels. Davis played his rookie season at Mike Linebacker before moving to the off-ball role in Washington's 4-2-5 base. His limited coverage instincts led to opposing coordinators attacking him with the wheel route throws to running backs almost every game. According to Pro Football Focus, Davis tied for the highest yard, yards per catch allowed, 12.1 last season, and ranked fourth worst in average depth of target with 5.5. That's not good at all, dog. So, he again, like I said, he showed flashes in coverage, but he wasn't perfect he wasn't consistent so what would be the resolution maybe he can still cover at times because the way he locked up Bijan robinson it's like you you don't want to throw that away you don't want to just completely throw away that trait the fact that he can do that like he did at the end of that falcons game but at the same time ask him to do it way less often the hope is the new defensive staff can get more from the fourth year linebacker quote i went through the last few years of every blitz Jamin had dan quinn said at the combine where do I see burst? Where do I see traits? All I can do is evaluate on that, and then you find ways to train them, unquote. As the Dallas Cowboys defensive coordinator, Quinn underwent a similar exercise with another physically gifted linebacker, Micah Parsons. Dallas began using Parsons more defensive end or anywhere to create a mismatch. And like I just said earlier, um, that I can see them basically evaluating Jamin Davis, looking at his old tape and being like, all right, so maybe you're better suited for these roles. We're going to switch it up a little bit. You're still going to be an off-ball linebacker more so than like a Micah Parsons, but maybe you should be rushing the passer a little bit more and things like that. Quote, putting a player like Parsons in the spots where they can do their thing. And that's where I enjoy most on the coaching is finding all of these unique things that a player can do. And then how do you feature them? Unquote from Dan Quinn. Or as another team's personnel executive put it, quote, just blitz them and have them chase the ball. Unquote. Davis had three sacks, eight tackles for loss, and eight quarterback pressures last season. And he barely was even sent at the quarterback. Imagine what you could do if that was like part of like the defensive scheme and game plan to consistently ask him to do that with that freakish athleticism. There's only like a handful of linebackers with actual athleticism to the level of a Jamin Davis. I feel like it's literally just more so the right coaching and you can get that out of him sadly he's about to be in the last year of his deal because i already know we're not picking up his fifth year option so it's gonna suck for him to go out there ball out right before we extend him hopefully we can go ahead and extend him this year for very cheap and then he goes out there and balls out we'll see but the goal is regardless of anything else i hope he balls out this upcoming season i mean getting him on a cheap contract is secondary compared to how about he just be good in the first place continuing with the article quinn said he had not discussed the situation with davis yet the linebacker is recovering from surgery after a week 13 shoulder injury another looming discussion involves picking up the 50 yard player option like i just talked about that seems unlikely based on davis's showing over the past three years on friday also davis received a suspended sentence of 180 days in jail for reckless driving in march of 2022 according to records from the Loudoun county virginia court and he will have his driver's license suspended for six months and must pay 2500 dollars worth of fine and now that i think about it, and i already did a full report on that and how he's basically avoiding jail time which is a great thing but he still has a lot of other things to do now i'm just thinking about the fact that if he has his license suspended for six months that means like the entire training camp mini camp and all of that type of stuff preseason and even some early regular season games i believe um oh wait maybe not regular season because this is february august so preseason um, but training camp and preseason, all of those practices on a daily basis, he's got the carpool with somebody. I just, I just now thought about how crazy that is. And then lastly, before we get up out of here, I'm seeing that there's some rumors around that the commanders may potentially be expected to have interest in signing Eagles free agent running back DeAndre Swift, who had 1,049 yards rushing last year and five touchdowns while being misused, might I add. DeAndre Swift was not being used correctly by the Eagles. He should have been used way more. He could have balled out. Every time they gave him an opportunity, it seemed like he balled out and then they would just stop running it with him and stop utilizing him. Just like how Eric Bieniemy, Brian Robinson was averaging like five yards per carry last season at times and then we would only run the ball like five times i'm like wait wait what's going on and deandre swift to basically put it into perspective for a lot of commanders fans who may not be aware deandre swift was basically being misused just like how eric Bieniemy was misusing brian robinson last year and he still put up 1049 yards and five touchdowns but again to go back to the rumor now granted this is from at nfl rums so a lot of these rumors for the most part never actually 
take place they never actually come into fruition not a lot of these never become reality but he worded it as the washington commanders are expected to have interest in signing eagles free agent deandre swift so i don't know that sounds pretty serious but we'll see now according to pro football focus he was graded the 45th best running back in the nfl last year that's not good at all i mean antonio gibson was 43rd and we're not even sure if we're gonna re-sign him to a cheap 3.5 million dollar per year contract so maybe you can get deandre swift for even cheaper than that just based off of pro football focus grades i mean if the work if the world worked like that that would be cool i guess and then brian robinson was graded the 23rd best running back so deandre swift is like a whole 22 running backs below him on the grading scale but you also got to think about the fact that Bijan robinson and saquon Barkley. Barkley, Joe Mixon, James Cook, a lot of Alvin Kamara, Jonathan Taylor, all of these guys were graded below Brian Robinson. Now, I feel like that's a mix of two things. First of all, pro football focus grades, take it with a grain of salt. But also, I think that also shows that Brian Robinson was very underrated last year. Like I've been telling a lot of people and I've been saying a lot and very often in my videos that even if you're looking at advanced statistics, he was technically a top 10 running back at least last year. And then pro football focus feels like he was literally better than those running backs I just listed off but at the same time they have deandre swift all the way down there even below ezekiel elliott which is crazy again i feel like it was more so of a case of the philadelphia eagles not using them the right way and i feel like the commanders potentially could because think about that fit of how deandre swift with how agile he is how he makes people miss at a crazy rate with how he can look in the cliff kingsbury air raid system that will force defenses to lighten up the box because the spirit of the air raid system is deep shots and defense is gonna have to account for that take safeties out of the box have them back there to be scared of and afraid of deep shots and with that light box a guy like deandre swift with less linebackers a defensive lineman trying to get him all of that open space imagine what he could do man deandre swift in the open space is scary and also he'll probably re be really cheap first of all in comparison to other running backs he already looks very cheap but just the running back position in general just like we talked about safeties being undervalued and super devalued by the nfl and maybe it's even collusion on the side of the nfl um and they're like doing this on purpose um running backs were even lower valued than safeties when i brought up those stats earlier in those numbers and it's pretty obvious remember last year running backs got together and had like a whole group chat and they were colluding together to basically be like if none of y'all sign any big deals maybe we can all hold out so everybody gets paid and all it took was for a couple of running backs one or two running backs to sign really cheap deals to give up on this whole standstill that they were trying to do together just completely breaking the solidarity and then everybody else ended up having to sign for cheap deals even a guy like saquon barkley ended up having to go back to the giants after he seemed very adamant about not going back for a cheap deal even he went back to the giants and had to swallow his pride for a cheap deal so the running back position is extremely undervalued so maybe with deandre swift already being a running back let alone but then on top of that being one of the lower valued guys of the running back position maybe we can get him for extremely cheap and man i mean like i said man the running backs folded last year i mean i know it's hard and it, i mean it's easy to say from this side of it but man maybe the running backs could have done something very special if they would have all held out but now look at them when no running backs were uh, tagged in as far as franchise tags and transition tags and they're like the only football group that didn't even have speculation about people being tagged like as of a couple of days ago where there was still rumors about this guy may get tagged this guy may not get tagged there wasn't a single running back that even had a slight rumor that they may get tagged if anything there was the opposite there were a few reports that this team is definitely not franchise tagging their star running back so hey man we may be able to steal them but yeah, man, that's the end of this video. Please get in the comment section. Let me know if you feel about everything discussed in this video. Please stiff on that like button, stiff on the subscription button, stiff on the bell next to that subscription button so you get notification each and every time I release an informative and opinion video just like this one. I did not expect this video to be this long at all. I'm not going to lie. So let me know how you feel about the whole Cameron Curl situation. How do you feel about the Jamin Davis situation? Are you optimistic like I am that they're going to finally unlock the first round talent in Jamin Davis or at the very least get way closer to doing that than Ron Rivera and Jack DeRio ever did? Also, let me know 
how you feel about the DeAndre Swift situation. First of all, do you believe that we may even have interest in him in the first place? And if we do, do you feel like it would be smart to sign him? And how much money would you be willing to give him? Something around with Antonio Gibson could potentially demand, according to Spot Track, like $3.5 million per year. Are you willing to do that? Also, how do you feel about the commanders potentially being very active in free agency, but not making any splash signings, any headlining signings? So let me know how you feel about all of that. Discuss this video again. I'm working on my best. I'm super busy working on videos, doing research for these videos, editing the videos and things like that. So I'm struggling to try to read and reply to as many comments as possible, but I'm really trying. So stay tuned. I really appreciate y'all, man. And also, before we get up out of here, I want y'all to know that when I first upload these videos, I always see like the comments, like the audio is not working. Just know that the audio may not work for you like for a little while, like immediately after I upload the video, especially on mobile devices, but just wait a little while, come back, it will work. Just a heads up. And also, of course, I'm gonna catch y'all later. Let me get back to this Ed, Ed Nettie, edit this video, and I'm out.